Hello, everybody. We're going to wait a couple of more minutes for people to come, and then we're going to get started. Okay, um, let's get going. Um, hello and welcome everybody. My name is Eric Kessler. I'm a senior product manager for Amazon Bracket. I run a team of applied scientists in the service and I'm super excited to be here and talk to you today. Uh, what I wanted to um, tell you a little bit about today is um, broadly about the topic of quantum machine learning and variational algorithms and how we at AWS see the intersection between machine learning and quantum computing. So um, let me, of course, we, we all know why we're here, and I don't want to bore you by going through um, the, the general pitch of quantum computing again, but stay with me. I will we'll probably make sense in a moment. So as you all know, we know about the holy grail algorithms within, under, within quantum computing with applications in different areas in a broad range, uh, broad range of uh, application spaces from cryptography, physics and chemistry, material science and optimization. And even though these algorithms will require error correction and those qubit numbers required, um, as you can see at the bottom of this slide, um, are probably deep in the future. These applications, in, in my view, um, are, are enough motivations to be really excited about this field and pursue this technology. Um, now, it's, it's hard to overstate how transformational this technology will be once we get devices that get to this, um, to, to this level of millions of qubits. Um, and and um, there will probably be a lot of applications that we don't even have on the radar today. But of course, we talk about millions of qubits that we need for our correction, and you see on this slide, the, 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 the approximation here that we have is uh, for 0.1% uh, error rate and it's a rough approximation, but um, we, we know that we are far, far away from having devices of that scale. Uh, but, you know, what do we do until then? Well, as you know, we are in the lucky situation that we have some ideas what we could potentially do with these devices on the way while we get to error correction and to large scale um, uh, quantum computers. Um, even though these devices are not error corrected, um, we have some ideas what we could do with them. And even if we don't know for sure that there will be an advantage in this intermediate regime, there is a lot to explore and a lot of research to be done. So you, of course, you know by this time what I'm talking about. Um, and over the last couple of days, you probably heard a lot about these variational algorithms that try to develop uh, applications and algorithms that utilize fewer qubits and shorter circuits than these kind of bottom-up um, error-corrected algorithms that we all know about. Uh, the, the problem here is that we don't really know how to write short-depth quantum circuits from the bottom up to do something useful. So as the solution, the idea is to borrow a very powerful idea, right? So we actually don't program the circuit directly, but instead we prescribe the circuit architecture in general, right? So the layout of the circuit, but leave open some free parameters and utilize a classical algorithm that iteratively finds the best circuits within those bounds. Now, probably you've heard about this idea throughout the conference many times now, but I do want to make this point and it's hard to overstate the magnitude of this paradigm shift in quantum computing, right? If you think back, quantum computing is coming from a place that was a very heavily dominated by theoretical considerations. And the early days of quantum computing, people were mostly focused on complexity theoretical arguments, developing algorithms from first principles. 
And you know, the discussion was more about this, this the scaling, the complexity of different uh, algorithms. Prefactors didn't matter that much. Uh, very much in the same way that computer science sometimes um, looks at the complexity of of of, of classical algorithms. Yeah? Um, there are only a handful of these algorithms, and they're very well understood theoretically. Now, in this new regime, people are talking about a different class of algorithms, these uh, variational algorithms, where we actually is exactly the opposite, right? We know very little theoretically, and progress is entirely driven by heuristics and by experiments, right? There's lots of variations, how you train them, how you design them, what's your ansatz, and so on. And in many ways, the answers to the question that we all care about, namely, will these algorithms work? Will they provide an advantage? In most cases, I think the answer will be, well, we don't know. We have to build it and find out. Now, that's a massive change in mindset, in the paradigm, how quantum computing and how quantum computing community works. Um, and, and, and yeah, it's a big, a big shift in, in, in the field. But luckily, this is not the first time that we're seeing such a shift, right? The field of machine learning under, went through a very similar evolution. And in many ways, quantum computing is in a very similar situation that machine learning was just a few decades ago. Even when you look at the algorithms, right? The algorithms are exactly the same, right? So you, you saw the picture on the, on the, on the slide before where we uh, iteratively adjust the parameters. Now, if you, if you replace the QPU box with a GPU box and the quantum circuit with a neural network, or you put everything behind the black box, right? it looks exactly the same. Uh, when I said before that every variational algorithm is based on the idea of let the algorithm find the best circuit within, those, within some bounds, well, machine learning does exactly the same. right? So you architect your neural networks and you architect your neural network and the, the connection of different layers and the architecture of the layers, they set the computational bounds within which the algorithm can find the best final model, right? So it's the same idea. And also, you know, we're in a similar place, right? Still today, we can't theoretically prove that the neural network is well suited to recommend the next movie to watch or that, um, you know, uh, you can uh, help a drone navigate obstacles, right? And, but the, the machine learning community fully leaned into this kind of adoption-led innovation, right? Experiment leading the way behind the theoretical understanding. Um, no, in front of the theoretical understanding, I meant to say. Uh, you know, I, I read somewhere, um, which is a very nice analogy that I, that I sometimes talk about, is uh, working in machine learning today is like, Building, building bridges or being an architect in an ancient society that hasn't developed the, the, the science of static yet, right? So you try to build a bridge and the bridge collapses. Someone, someone comes up with the idea of a pillar and then pillars are all the rage and everybody builds pillars, but we don't know if there's another architecture that might even work better like a hanging bridge that you know, would allow us to build much, much better and, and longer bridges. This is probably very you know, overly simplifying and provocative, but there's some truth to it, right? And um, in, in, in machine learning now for decades, this has been the situation, right? Theory follows experiment. People are building stuff, they're trying out things, um, empirical results are way ahead of our theoretical understanding. Um, and you know, to, to, to illustrate that point, also to date, we don't really fully understand why deep learning models train so well, despite having highly non-convex um, objective functions. And, you know, this build and try mentality, for better or for worse, uh, quantum computing will probably follow in that path for the next years. Uh, it's extremely difficult to prove anything about these heuristical algorithms. And the best way is just, you know, to build these devices and try out new ideas. And I'm sure there will be um, some surprises and a lot of interesting discoveries along the way. Now, I've talked about the adoption-led innovation. I think there's a lot we can learn from the machine learning community, um, just leaning into that build and test uh, uh, mentality, but there's more, right? So differentiable computing, the idea of backpropagation was really was um, helping neural networks uh, break through uh, and also the open source tooling end user libraries that make it easy and intuitive to train and build and experiment with these models were, were fundamental um, for the breakthrough of deep learning. 
And I want to spend some time to, to, to dive a little bit deeper into that because I, you know, my point is, <laughs> as, you, as you probably have got it at this point, um, is that we have a lot to learn from the machine learning community uh, when we look at quantum computing today. So as, as we said, uh, machine learning underwent a very similar evolution as, as we're seeing at the moment in quantum computing, right? If you think back to the early 50s when the first perceptron models or what we today would call a feed forward neural network was invented or proposed, the focus at that time was very much on the theoretical understanding of the computational complexity of these models, right? There was no hardware to run these things on. Huh? And I think the first perceptron model actually was run on special purpose hardware at the time that was built specifically for, <laughs> for that one experiment. Um, and, and like in variational quantum computing today, it, you know, people struggled over probably more than a decade or two to make any measurable or, or, or significant progress, I should say, in the theoretical understanding. And that led us to this phenomena that probably many of you are very familiar with this, what people today call the AI winter, right? People didn't make progress on the theoretical understanding. There was no devices, there was no um, uh, mechanisms to actually build and try these things out. And so the, the, the field went dormant a little bit. It blossomed up again uh, around the 80s when people rediscovered the um, backpropagation algorithm and applied them for the first time to the training of large deep neural networks. Um, uh, I think that was the famous um, uh, work from Jan LeCun, who for the first time, the backpropagation algorithm was applied to the training of um, neural networks in a relatively small scale um, experiment um, in the context of convolutional neural networks. Um, but still, when you then look towards when what, what we call the deep learning revolution um, came about, we can, of course, debate when exactly that happened. But for argument's sake, it took another two decades or even three decades from when we had all the pieces together, frankly, um, until we actually saw it show up in meaningful industry penetration. So what was missing, right? I would argue there are three components, three pillars that were required to really help deep learning and machine learning come uh, you know, break through into industry. On the one hand, obviously, the, the, the availability of hardware and data and make hardware and data accessible to a lot of different people, researchers, developers, et cetera. The second, although the backpropagation algorithm was known since you know, the 70s, I think, and then applied to, new, uh, to, to, to neural networks in the 80s, open source tooling that made it easy for developers to, 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 to build neural networks, to build machine learning models was fundamental to, to you know, abstract this away and uh, make it more accessible. And then third, all these advances helped bring together a diverse, diverse community, bringing machine learning out of the lab and into industry. Right. So first, deep learning was always thought of in the context of speech recognition, uh, image recognition. But then when it came to industry and a lot of different people from a lot of different fields started experimenting with these models, the use cases changed and evolved. Right. So today people are using deep learning models for forecasting, for recommendation, for all sorts of applications in everyday operations. Like companies like Amazon, um, there are lots of different you know, thousands and thousands of different models that touch a lot of different components of our company. And you see, without, without sounding too grandiose, right? So it's a little, um, it, this is a little bit what, what, what we're trying to, to, to emulate with, with Amazon Bracket, yeah? So we have Amazon Bracket as our quantum computing service um, that provides on-demand access to quantum computing technologies to get more people involved, get this, uh, uh, early stage prototype devices and simulators into the hands of many um, researchers and, and developers. It comes without upfront commitment and you can build where, where your data is already, right? Um, we also recently um, announced and we're working very closely with the team from the library Penny Lane. Um, we are part of the steering council. Penny Lane is a library that makes it easy to build um, variational quantum algorithms and more importantly, brings mat mature machine learning tooling to quantum computing, right? So you can literally 
um, program your variation quantum algorithms in TensorFlow or PyTorch or um, uh, or other um, machine learning uh, libraries that you can utilize for that. And it's community driven and, and open to everybody. Yeah. And, and finally, right, we also want to bring quantum computing as these devices mature and we get more um, opportunities to test out uh, these heuristics. We want to bring quantum computing out of the lab, right? We want to connect domain experts to this technology and also bridge the gap between machine learning and quantum computing. And that, you know, is something that is um, kind of very, very, very dear to my heart, right? I have, uh, have a formal education in quantum computing, my PhD in the field and a postdoc. But then I worked for a long time on the machine learning side. And, you know, from my experience, um, I've, I've been part of both communities and both communities are fantastic places, right? So I think uh, on the machine learning side, I learned a lot from just the, the builder attitude and, and, and this uh, mindset of, of try and tr trial and failure and, 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 and just building things and trying things out. And obviously the quantum computing community uh, there's a lot of the smartest people that I've met in my life working in this field, and it continues to amaze me what people are doing in this field and, and, and the, the innovation and research that's coming out of there. Um, so, you know, I'm really excited to, to try to build bridges between these two communities. On the one hand, making quantum computing more accessible to the machine learning community um, by providing them tooling that they're familiar with in the form of Penny Lane. Uh, and, and vice versa, using, um, uh, using uh, uh, the, the, the tooling um, that machine learning has built uh, to advance quantum computing, right? We can learn a lot in terms of the optimization algorithms around that and around uh, the, the, the ideas and, and research that has been done on convergence and, and how these objective functions are structured, et cetera. Uh, that 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 both communities can benefit from. So that that, that is that is something I think is very interesting, and I think there's a lot uh, a lot of synergies between these two communities that we'll begin to explore. So I mentioned uh, I mentioned the um, the big role the backpropagation algorithm played in the evolution of of uh, of machine learning um, specifically. And just as a little reminder um, to show you the analogy between uh, machine learning and quantum computing, it, it, it makes sense to just spend two minutes revisiting that. Right? So in, in machine learning, when you have a neural network model, for example, and you want to train it, the backpropagation algorithm, and in a nutshell, allows you to efficiently compu compute the gradients of the objective function that is produced by your neural network. Right? So at every step of the training, you provide some subset of your data to the neural network and the network is initialized with some weights. Yeah? And then these network operations just tell you as a way to compute a number out of these, um, you know, out of these inputs. Um, and then there's the backpropagation algorithm that I don't wanna go into detail, um, but there's something happening there that allows you to get from the, the, the forward computation you get the, the, the gradient through traversing backwards through the network and you can calculate exactly analytically um, this gradient. Um, and then you use that gradient to adjust your parameters, the weights as you call them in machine learning and then you reiterate that cycle, yeah? Um, and it turns out in machine learning, you can do something, oh, sorry, in, in quantum computing, you can do something uh, completely analogous, right? So here, we provide some weights or parameters typically to our um, circuit. We may or may not have data, right? If we talk about the quantum machine learning model, um, we have also data assets that, that go in or data sets that go into this model. But if we talk about uh, optimization or uh, computational chemistry, um, we actually don't have data. We just encode our problem in the structure of the circuits that we have. So we provide these weights. Um, we may have some data here. Um, and then, for example, there is a, a, an analogous idea to backpropagation, which is called the parameter shift rule, um, that allows you to exactly calculate the gradient also here. Yeah? And um, moving forward, you do exactly the same. You adjust your parameters and you feed it back in. Um, so interestingly, this parameter shift rule, let's look under the hood. Um, it allows you to very uh, easily compute um, uh, gradients along a single dimension. Um, as you can see here from this uh, simplified formula, 
And it's, it looks a lot like uh, a finite difference formula here, uh, but I should note this is an exact, this is an exact uh, formula. It's not an approximation. Um, and it allows you to exactly calculate the gradient. And, and so this is fully differentiable. Um, you can include it in, in, in machine learning models that are end-to-end -end, um, uh, differentiable and, and do exactly the same as we did in machine learning. Now, I, sh I should note, obviously, while the, the backpropagation algorithm has established itself as the way to, to, to calculate gradients in machine learning, I think in quantum computing, that's much more of an open question. This is one example, the parameter shift rule. But there are also many other ways that people are experimenting, trying to find um, uh, ways to approximate gradients uh, and, 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 and do different things to see what's more robust to noise, what is more cost effective, and so on and so forth. But in any case, when you, when you want to calculate these gradients, you always have to calculate um, a lot of different circuit evaluations, right? And so with Amazon Bracket, just to give one example, we want to make the experimentation cycle a lot faster, right? We want to help customers um, experiment with these algorithms um, in the most efficient way. So what you do when you build an algorithm, for example, you um, start experimenting against um, simulators, for example, right? So you want to first tune your algorithms before you run on actual quantum hardware. So now when you want to evaluate these gradients, um, you need to evaluate a lot of these circuits. Now with Amazon Bracket, you can use Penny Lane to completely scale that out in the cloud, right? So you have a batch of circuits that you can just send to Amazon Bracket and we do all everything under the hood to simulate these tasks for you, bring them back. And, and that allows you to iterate much faster um, over um, different settings and fine tunings of your uh, algorithm to, to, you know, to fine tune it so you can then run the final uh, result on an actual quantum computer. Um, and through this kind of scaling out and vertical scaling, uh, sorry, horizontal scaling in the cloud, um, you can see it, you get a much, uh, a pretty large uh, performance boost. So one question that, that people uh, uh, always ask me is, okay, so we know variational quantum computing is here for this NISC era, um, but what happens once we have our corrected devices? Are variational algorithms going to go away? Are they purely a bridge technology? Um, and will they become obsolete? <clears throat> well, I mean, I think the answer is, I don't know. And, and I don't think anybody truly knows, um, but we can, again, look over the aisle um, and, and, and see what happened in, in, you know, in classical computing, right? As I mentioned before, the idea of variational algorithms or machine learning, deep learning models um, started with, computer vision and natural language processing. And, and why did it start there? Well, because it's extremely hard to program bottom-up you know, algorithms for computer vision. There's just, we, we don't know how to do it, frankly. Right? So differential computing came along, deep learning, and completely took over this field. Right? Their entire academic careers that were obli obliterated <laughs> after um, deep learning came along, where people tried to first hand engineer features and, and algorithms to recognize certain uh, patterns and images. And it was completely turned over by um, variational and or differentiable programming. Um, and, and from there, it started advancing into more and more domains. Now, in quantum computing, well, you know, you can argue, we actually don't know very well how to write quantum algorithms bottom up, right? I mentioned we have a handful of algorithms that we know how to write them, yeah? Um, but it's highly unintuitive. It's very difficult to, to build and develop quantum algorithms. Yeah, it's not easy. So there is, is, is an open question, but there is some, 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 you know, some good intuition that we could say that potentially this, what people in machine learning call the unreasonable effectiveness of neural networks, maybe that extends into quantum computing, right? So maybe variational approaches um, will, in, in my estimation, probably be very relevant also when we have um, when we have uh, error corrected devices. Um, obviously, there's a long time to go and there's a lot of uh, new things to discover uh, until we're there, um, but it's going to be interesting to see. Um, so lastly, I'm already running up a little bit against time, but I wanted to, to tell you how you can get started with Amazon Bracket yeah, because we want to make it easy um, and, and help customers um, get started with these ideas. Um, Amazon Bracket is a fully managed AWS service um, that helps you get started with quantum computing. Um, we provide uh, what we call build, test, and run. Yeah, So we have development environments that help you build your algorithms. You can test them on the simulators that we discussed before. And of course, and most importantly, you can, you can run them securely 
and on demand on quantum computing hardware. Today, um, we're providing access to D-Wave, IonQ, and Rigetti devices, different modalities um, of quantum computing. And we expect in the future to support on Amazon Bracket in the fullness of time, every relevant modality of quantum computing. Uh, most importantly, right, these de devices are just available on demand, integrated into AWS. Everybody can spin up the AWS console, open Amazon Bracket, and access these devices um, without any upfront commitment. You only pay for what you use. Um, and as I mentioned before, we also have a host of different um, circuit simulators available on the service, from rapid prototyping in the local simulator in the Bracket SDK to uh, managed high performance simulators um, with uh, um, state vector simulation or tensor network simulation. So there's a lot of different use cases that you can approach with that. And finally, the only thing left to say is uh, for me, let's go build, right? Um, you, you can get started in, in, in minutes by going to um, uh, our, our, uh, our console at awsamazon.com uh, slash bracket. Um, we also have uh, a, a couple of um, tutorials available under this address up here. Um, generally speaking, this Amazon Bracket examples gives you uh, a nice tutorials to get started with Amazon Bracket and with Penny Lane and, and, and the other features on our service. Um, so yeah, I'm looking forward to see um, people uh, signing up and, and com coming to the service to try this out. And um, with that, thank you so much. Um, Happy to uh, answer a couple of questions if there are any. <laughs> hey, Moira, I, I think I see. Um... Hi, Eric. I've got one question that I've just yes. pasted in there for you, but it's a very obviously a very broad question. Uh, but there's one I can see there for you. Okay. Um, what can you see as being the next near term step should be step in quantum computing in commerce? <laughs> the next near term step. Okay, I got yeah. it. Um, yeah, you see, I mean, we, we, we talk to a lot of customers um, that are using Amazon Bracket today. Um, for 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 industry applications, if that is the is the, is the question uh, here, for many of our customers, um, specifically in the domain of computational chemistry, they they, they really see quantum computing as the next um, truly disruptive technology for the industry, um, and they want to understand the technology. They want to understand where um, where uh, you know where the applications are. Um, now, what is the next step? And obviously, the next milestone for quantum computing is to have a demonstrable um, advantage in a, in a relevant um, problem. We have all seen the quantum advantage or quantum supremacy um, experiment um, from two years ago now, I believe, right? That for the first time demonstrated quantum computers being useful for a task or being, being, being more powerful than their classical counterparts for, for a computational task that is you know, completely um, constructed and not useful for anything. Um, but it demonstrated that we can truly do something new with quantum computers that we cannot do before on, on classical hardware. So now obviously the next step is to see if, if there is, um, if there is a near-term application for quantum computing, and we can find something. I, I think if you to ask me where we would expect something like that to happen, I think it will be, um, you know, very much dependent on um, on on having probably some 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 kind of co-design and 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 going really down to the level of um, uh, the, exposing every level that the device has that that we can that we can access um, to to demonstrate. Um, in the spirit of variational algorithms, that there's something that we can that we can show, and, and seeing this scaling advantage for the first time. Yeah, that leads on very well with the next question, which is which area do you think we will see quantum advantage? Quantum mm -hmm. chemistry, condensed matter physics, or finance? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I think it's an it's an open question. Um, look, I think there there is obviously a hope that. Um, that, that we will start seeing um, 
and, and quant quantum advantage in 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 probably some physics material science um, applications where where you want to understand the properties of say materials or physical systems that are already very close to the device that you're building right um, I, I think that is a kind of a natural starting point to look at um, but you say and you see I mean I think that the, the, the race is open people are looking at, at different problems and, and different representations in, in, in quantum computing hardware um, if, if you know, I think that the closer the system that you want to describe is to what you're actually building there's 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 the most um, hope uh, to, to find something and 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 so when you think about understanding the fundamental properties of, of matter and things like that uh, quantum many body systems and understanding emergent properties I think there will be uh, you know the, the, there's a high probability that we're going to find something there we've got another three questions that have come through and I think we might have time for these the next one is is there any chance at some point advanced users could get pulse level access to quantum devices I mean the full control of being able to explore new ways of controlling the quantum chip beyond the prescribed control yes we are we're working and and we're planning to 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 give customers access to pulse level control um, uh, in, in the forms of them Okay, uh, another one is here is when will the IMQ 32 qubit system be available on AWS? <laughs> yeah, we're all very excited about that. Um, I don't have a definite date for that yet. Okay, and one last question for today is does noise affect variational algorithms much? Is it possible that noise gets optimized away and in the process and error correction is no longer that important? Yeah, so you see, I mean, the, the original intent behind these variational algorithms was a little bit for that, right? So, so the algorithm could correct itself specifically for coherent noise sources and, and error them uh, or, you know, um, um, negate them out. Um, but it is very unlikely that we will get away without any error correction in the long term, right? Because noise um, does, you know, destructively uh, remove the quantum coherence um, and, and there's no way to recover it if your circuit gets too long. Yeah, um, I think the hope of variational algorithms is that we can get away with lower depth circuits that still preserve coherence, um, but I don't think there's a lot of hope that we just build longer circuits and hope that the, through variational optimization, um, uh, we, we, we get our way out of the decoherence trap, right? Because we know at some point that the, the, there's no quantum effect anymore. If we have just circuits that are long enough, the noise will take over and it's essentially becoming a classical system. So, um, you know, variational optimization can do a lot, but it cannot um, replace error correction in that sense. Okay, I think that's it for the questions. Um, it was a really enjoyable session. Thank you very much. And if anybody wants to see this again, it's actually going to be on demand for a month so you can watch through um, Eric's presentation. Thank you so much. And I'll be um, hanging out at the AWS booth for a while if you have any okay. questions. Thank you, so Thank much. you very much. Thank you, everybody. Bye bye. Bye.